called to be ministers, right? We're all called to the ministry. That doesn't mean being a pastor. That doesn't mean necessarily being in full-time work, but that means going out and sharing our story. You know, I love our, our verse for this year, Be Thou an Example. What's the best way to share God with someone these days, in my opinion, is by our actions, by what we do, how we do it, when we do it, how we respond. So a couple of years ago, actually almost five years ago, I set up a ministry called Handling Life. And it's basically a ministry that goes out and encourages, uh, engages, and challenges evangelical Christians, people who are saved, people who are going to heaven, but they've been, they look like they've been sucking on lemons. If you ever want to see miserable people, where can you see a lot of them at one time? Church on Sunday morning. Right? And so I was that person. I was unfortunately that person for a long time in my life that if someone looked at me and said, if that's a Christian, no thank you. I don't want any of that. I don't want the laws and the regulations and the life that comes with that if that's all you're going to get out of it. So turn with me in, your, in, the, in the scriptures here as I tell a little bit more about this. So I've also written a book, uh, Jonah 1.3. I've also written a book called Modern Day Jonah. The font's really small here because it's a, a fairly long endorsement, uh, but Dr. Gary Chapman, who wrote The Five Love Languages, has endorsed my book. I've got a draft out right now, but the new one's coming out in about a month. And I've got a little brochure here that we'll hand out at the end. It's kind of a prayer card and tells uh, Pat Robert, I mean Gordon Robertson and Mike Huckabee and Tim Lee and Harold Vaughn and a bunch of other... Uh, Believers have been kind enough to give me an endorsement of it. It's basically a story of my life. It's a, it's a ministry that, that uses podcasts and videos. I'm on Truth uh, Radio. Joey keeps telling me that I have a good face for radio, and I'm not sure. He says it as a compliment, but I'm not sure how he means it yet. So what is a modern-day Jonah? Modern-day Jonah is someone who ignores God's calling on their life. They make a conscious decision to disobey God. Their actions are deliberate and calculated. They are fully aware of their choice, just like Jonah. So what do we see in Jonah 1.3a? Jonah rose up to flee. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to share. God, we pray for our pastor. Thank you for his leadership. Thank you for his desire and heart to share the word with us. We pray for he and his family during this time, Lord. Uh, give them uh, some uh, comfort and give them rest. Lord, I pray for each and every individual in this uh, church this evening, Lord. Pray for their finances. Pray for their physical health. Pray for their work, their uh, professional side, Lord, everything that's going on in their life. I just pray for them that no matter what's going on, they will remember that you're in control. And Lord, we thank you for this time of year and for Christmas and the birth of our Lord and Savior. Amen. So what does the word flee here mean? So if you go to the Hebrew here and look at the word flee, it means to flee suddenly, to run away, to make haste. So this wasn't something that Jonah was like, oh, well, let me think about this. Let me consider what God might have me to do. No, it says when he heard what God wanted him to do, he ran the other way. He got out of Dodge as fast and as quick as he could. I've done that. Shamed to admit it. But if there's anybody in here who couldn't admit that, then, you know, we'll talk about that later. But everyone's done that, right? Everyone's made that decision. You've made that choice to flee. You know, I've made that choice. I have try not to make it as much as I used to. But it comes down to this when you, and you don't have to flip to all of these, but uh, there, that's why I put them on the, the paper here. But Joshua 24, 15 and it says, if, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose 
you this day whom you will serve. Choose. Jonah had a choice. I had a choice. And you had a choice. So is serving God really hard? Or is it that I make it hard and you make it hard? Because serving God is actually easy on paper. When you look at the New Testament, there's only so many things that God asks us to do to obey Him. See, right here we have that choice means to choose to make a choice. So you can choose every day to obey God or to disobey God. Right? Is there anything in the Scriptures that you can find that negates your obligation to obey God? There's nothing in here. There's no if, ands, or buts. Well, I don't want to obey God because they hurt my feelings. Or I know better than God. I think this is better for me, so I want to go this way, like Jonah did. Well, I don't want to do that. Is there anything in here that gives you that right to do that? See, when we do that, we lead into what I have coined as the modern-day Jonah syndrome. This is a condition caused when a believer ignores God's calling in their life. What's God's calling on our lives? What's God's will for our life? It used to be really complicated for me. I used to really spend a lot of time, God, show me your will. And then I just kind of sat back and I had an excuse. I had a way out because there wasn't a neon sign. There wasn't a burning bush. There wasn't something that said, hey, go exactly this way, 600 feet and take a left. I couldn't, you know, turn it, the, the GPS on my phone and tell me how to get there. And then a couple of years ago, I really thought about it and I started looking at God's word. Do you know what his will is for our lives after we're saved? Show the love of Christ to others. Share the gospel with others. Forgive. Be kind. If you start going down through that list, there's not a lot of things that God asks of us. See, because if our heart's right, what else is going to be right? Our actions, our life, the way we treat others, the way we treat our spouse, the way we treat our kids. So when you look at the modern-day Jonah syndrome, the root calls here is that the believer's sin nature, my sin nature, your sin nature, your flesh, creates something within you that says, I want to I do it my way. I want to satisfy my needs and my desires, and I want to do what I want to do, when I want to do it and how I want to do it. And so when we make that choice, it creates within us a struggle. See, because we can't serve two masters. And I grew up here. I mean, I went to Kerwin Baptist Christian School to the 10th grade, graduated from Woodland. My two older brothers graduated from Kerwin. For a long time in my life, I always thought the two masters, you know, hero, God, and devil. But when you read this, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. You know what hold means here? It says to hold firmly to, to cleave to. Anybody love candy canes? It's Christmas time. I love candy canes, but they're not good for me. There's a lot of things in our life, in our flesh, that, that we love and we want to hold on to. And we don't want to let go of it. But it's not good for us. Did Jonah do anything wrong from an earthly standpoint? You ever thought about that? Did he sneak on the boat? Did he kill anybody? Did he lie to anybody? At the beginning, no. When he got on the boat, he did nothing wrong from an earthly standpoint. And I've been there where I've made choices, I've made decisions that violated no earthly laws, no earthly ethics, no earthly morals, Everything was right from an earthly standpoint, but I was 100% wrong with God. I was holding on to something that took me away from God instead of to Him. 
See, when you make that choice to hold on to something, if we're holding on to God, it creates a servitude, a slave to God. But if you're holding on to the world, if you're holding on to the earthly side, if you're holding on to I know best, you become a slave to that. If you try to go make more money and that becomes your driving force, which was one of my driving forces in the past, and you think, I can make more money, and if I make more money, I will spend more time with, with God and my family, and I will spend more time with my health. Does that ever work out for anyone? Because when you start making more money, what do you do? If God's not your priority, you start spending more money. And when you spend more money, what do you have to do? You have to make more money. And then you have to spend more money. And then you make more money. And then before it's all said and done, are you spending any more time with your family? You're spending less. You're physically present, but you're mentally absent. For some, it might not be money. It might be TV. It might be friends. It might be family. It might be anything other than God. So you're holding on to the wrong thing, which is making you a slave to that. You're having to serve that. And mama here means a wealth. We always look at that sometimes as riches, but it's really a trust. It's a treasure a person trusts in. If you're operating from the flesh, if you're operating in yourself, what are you ultimately going to be putting your trust in? Yourself. So when I ask you here, what are you holding on to? If you're not where you want to be in your life, if you, you know, say, hey, I'm a, I'm a modern-day Jonah. You know, things aren't going the way. I know I'm looking into to what is going on in my life. What is it? What are you striving to, for here? What have you become a slave to? What are you having to serve? I equate it like this. If you go to an ATM, and you put money into the ATM. This is like praying to God and Him not answering your prayers. Okay, so you go to the ATM, you put your card in. You punch your PIN number in, and it says, declined. You know what the best thing to do right then? Start kicking that machine as hard as you can and shaking it. Why are you declining my card? Is that what we should do? No, what we should do is back up and say, why isn't there money in the account? Well, there's no money in the account because you don't have a job. You're not working. You're not putting your paycheck in the account. Or you do have a job, but instead of putting the money into the account, you're spending it on other stuff, frivolous stuff. So when you go to get money out of the account, there's none there. Well, if you're not getting your prayers answered, look at what kind of prayers you're saying. Are you doing them for the flesh? Are you doing them for your desires? Because... If you're going to God and you're not putting that time into a relationship, you've not built a relationship with God, you're not asking for the right things, you're not trying to serve Him, you're trying to serve your flesh, is God going to answer your prayers? No. But what's the natural reaction? The natural reaction is to say, well, where's God in my life? I remember for a number of years in my life, I'd pray, God, just help me get out of this situation that I got myself into. But I didn't want to do things the way God wanted me to do it. I just wanted him to solve them for me. I wanted to have the nice, pretty white picket fence and have God on the left-hand side and my life on the right-hand side, and I get to do what I want to do, but when I needed God, I wanted him to be there. It doesn't work that way. It does not work that way. Having the white picket fence, having it you know, in trying to run to God to get something out of Him when we've not been doing things the right way doesn't work. It is literally the old analogy and in the Bible, you reap what you sow. If you put the time into something, if you put the effort into it, do you reap the benefits? Yes. Do you reap the consequences if you don't do it right? Yes. You know, Jonah reaped his consequences. He had things that went on in his life that affected his choices, affected all aspects of his life. Everything that he was involved with affected 
everything. He affected others around him. He affected people he didn't even know. And see, when we make those wrong choices, when we get into that situation where we've decided to do things our way, it comes with side effects. These are, you know, some of them, but they're not all of them. Stress. Anybody in here stress? Anxiety? Conflict? About five years ago when I finally figured out what was the common denominator of my conflict, do you know what it was? Me. If you're in constant conflict, I've got good news and bad news for you. The good news is there's a way to resolve it. The bad news is if you're in constant conflict, it's you. It's not everybody else. Bitterness, misery, chaos, strife, confusion, depression. What did Jonah do when he first got on the boat? Went to sleep. What do you do when you're depressed? You sleep. He might have had a good time for a time period. The Bible doesn't say how long it was from the time period he got on the boat to the time that the storms came and he you know, was depressed and went to sleep in that. It doesn't say. But it was far enough that he couldn't jump off the boat and swim back to shore. So he probably had some pretty sunrises and pretty sunsets. Isn't that what happens in our life? You make the wrong choice. Is the consequence immediate? No. Not normally. Normally, when we sin, the consequences come somewhere down the line. doesn't happen immediately. But you know, the thing that, that I look back on in my life, and even still today, when you're not where God wants you to be, and you're saved, in the still of the night, when nobody else is around, you have that feeling. You know in the back of your mind, I need to get right with God. I need to start doing things His way. But then we make excuses. We make things up. Oh, I can't do that. You know, one of my biggest things, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. One of my biggest things that kept me from fully buying into to God and doing his, his, things His way was a simple thought. If I give God control... I won't have control. Anybody else ever had that one? Anybody wants to admit it? Well, if I do things God, if I do things His way, if I do things God's way, I won't be able to do them mine. That was the number one thing that held me back for years. Do you know what I have found now? The more I do things God's way, do you know what happens? The more control I have. The more I do things God's way, the more control I get in my life. It makes no sense. I don't understand it. It makes absolutely no sense. But when we don't do things God's way, we get to chaos, the side effects. You know, why does this happen? Why do we have these symptoms in our lives when we're not doing things God's way? Because James 1.8 says it clearly. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Do you know what unstable here means? With no controlling rules or principles to give order. Out of balance. Midst of the storms. Now, for clarity here, there's a difference between a Jonah and a Job. Job had no decision. He had no choice in where he ended up. Jonah had every choice. Jonah 2.1, I don't have it on the sheet here, but you can look it up in the Hebrew. Jonah says his affliction, which means his choice, his actions caused him to be in the belly of the well. So right here, what James is talking about is your choice, your double-mindedness. Go back to the Matthew 6.24. You trying to serve two masters... You trying to do it God's way, but also do it your way, has led you to be unstable in all your ways. So when we start to make the choice that we want to do it our way and not God's way, the Bible is very clear. Hey, this is what you're going to get. This is the chaos you're going to cause. This is the strife. This is the conflict. This is what's going to happen in your life. 
you're going to be upside down. Things are not going to, they might for a season. They might for a time period go the way you want them to go until they don't. Do you know that in, in the story of Jonah, when he finally got right with God, when he finally came back after sleeping and lying and trying to blame others and do all the things that I've done and I'm sure you've done, blame it on everybody else. It's their fault. It's Nick's fault. It's everybody else's fault except mine. And then Jonah finally says, hey, it's me. It's my fault. Did he jump out of the boat himself? No. Why? Pride? Ego? Self-centeredness? He knew exactly where God wanted him to be, but he couldn't do it on his own. Have you ever felt at that point where no one would understand what you were going through? Have you ever been there where you're like, I can't even tell God about this because what will he think? I've had those thoughts. I can't tell anybody about this. So you get over in a corner like Jonah did, and the storms just keep beating on you, and they're beating on you, and they're beating on you. And Jonah finally has to say to the unsaved, hey, can you help me do what I need to do to get where God wants me to be? He sought counsel. He sought help. He sought wisdom from others. And at the point that he became the example that he was supposed to be, what happened to those mariners? What did they do after they threw Jonah overboard? They gave their lives to God. See, when Jonah wasn't where he was supposed to be, they had no idea he was a Christian. They had no idea who he was. Is that how you are? If we were at your work, or we were at your gym, or where you hang out, would people identify you as a Christian? If they did identify you as a Christian, what kind of Christian would they identify you as? What would they say about you? So let's look at the cure. The cure to the modern-day Jonah syndrome is pretty simple. God is not very complicated from a, a God perspective, but it's getting right with God and applying His Word to our lives. It's really easy to say. It's hard to do. Does anybody else here struggle to get up every morning and read their Bible? Anybody else struggle to pray for five minutes? I can play Candy Crush for 30 minutes and struggle to pray for five. That's what it is. But if we want to avoid, if we want to avoid storms, that we have a choice in. Think about right now. Is there a time if you had applied the simple, very simple principle of a soft answer turns away wrath, could you have avoided an argument with your spouse? If my wife would apply that to her life, we would avoid all kinds of arguments. She already bought my Christmas present, so we're good. Right? One, one simple principle. Soft answer turns away wrath. How many arguments would you have avoided in your relationships or at work? How many unkind words would you have not said? How much conflict could you have avoided? One principle. And then you start opening up God's word and saying, well, if I started applying this, if I started loving others, if I started being kind, if I started forgiving, bitterness to me is a thing that I have a hard time forgiving others, and I have a hard time asking to be forgiven. But if you start practicing forgiveness, if you start asking to be forgiven, it lifts these burdens off of you. It takes things out of your life. You can start to find that joy that James talks about in circumstances. So the solutions here, and there's many of them in here, but these are just kind of three quick ones here. Matthew 6, 33a. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. You've got to make a choice. This is a choice. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. First means at the beginning. So when you put a, a filter, a lens over your life, and you look at how should I handle this situation, or what's God's will for my life, what new job should I take, where should I move, or what should I do, it should be right here first. Seek ye, the, seek ye first the kingdom of God. How would God have you do it? How would God have you respond to that text that someone sent to you that's very, not very nice? 
is the best way to send back and say, well, you think I'm an idiot? Well, you're a moron. It's probably not the best way to respond. I've done that a few times, unfortunately. So this is a daily choice. It's a daily choice to study the Bible. It's a daily choice to pray. James 1, a says, be ye doers of the word. Do you know there's a difference between knowing and applying? Because a doer here is a doer, carry out, perform. How many of you know not to play in the street? How many of you apply that? How many of you know God's word but struggle to apply it? I do. There's a difference between knowledge. Knowledge is knowing what to do. Wisdom is the application of said knowledge. Right here, though, the Bible says if we want to do this, this is a choice. we got to be doers of the Word. See, just because you get saved doesn't mean all of a sudden you're going to do everything the Bible that God wants you to. Just outline the Bible. You have to make the choice to do it. The last here is the 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. This is a tough one. This is where the rubber really hits the road, right? Because if we have the faith that the God who sent His Son to die on the cross for us can save our souls from hell, and that we can spend eternity with Him in heaven, but we don't think He can solve our financial problems, or our professional, our job problems, or our relationship problems, or our life problems, or our spiritual problems, our health problems. So we, we can have faith that He's going to save our soul. We're going to spend eternity with Him, but we can't have faith and confidence in Him that He's going to take care of us in our normal day life. We can't have confidence that if we apply His Word to our life and give Him control, that we will have the life that He's promised for us. That's what it really comes down to, right? So let me show you something here real quick as we close up. Oh, I'm sorry. So faith there is the belief, trust, and confidence. So you got, you got two sheets in front of you. And David talked about this briefly uh, right before he came up. So it's simple. How fast can you find these numbers? Let me see my phone. The sheets are both the same. So you don't have to, um, you can choose either one. Don't start yet. Don't start looking for any numbers, okay? Don't cheat. We're in church. Nick, you're not supposed to have already started. All right, so you're going to get 60 seconds. When you look at this sheet here, the numbers are 1 through 88. They're both the same. Uh, you get 60 seconds to see how many numbers. You can't skip any. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 to, to 88. It's pretty simple in that. So are you ready? you got 60 seconds. I'm going to count it off. When you mark, get set, Go. All right, stop. What number did you reach? Anybody, everybody get to one? <laughs> I've done this with about 3,000 people. I've not failed to get people at least to one in all of those. What number did you reach? Anybody get 10? 12? 24? And he started like an hour ago, so that's... What'd you get, Tanya? 15? 18? 30? 40? Anybody get over 40? All right. So let me show you how th this right here. So look at the sheet. At the very top, the bottom, the middle, I mean the left and the right, there's little hashtags. So if you fold it over, you know, in fours, 
you will see that the number one is up in the top left-hand corner. Number two is in the top right-hand corner. Threes in the bottom, I'm sorry, number one's in the top, I'm going to turn towards y'all, top left, top right, bottom right, bottom left. So one, two, three, clockwise. You see the pattern? So five's going to be in the quadrant with number one. The numbers are all the same. Does everybody see the pattern? All right. Nick, Nick's already started, so uh, we're going to take another. He, he hasn't. I'm just giving you a hard time. We're going to take another 60 seconds and do this same exercise, same numbers, and see what the number is you get. All right? On the back, uh, yeah, there should be two, two copies of it. Yes, yeah, on the back side. So on the back side, you have a fresh copy there. You ready? Set, go. All right, stop. Anybody do worse the second time than the first time? Anybody double what they did the first time? Triple? What'd you, you got two more? That's okay. Why did you do better? Because you knew the order, right? It's better than the first time. You know, I laugh here as a, a commercial presentation, but did you get smarter in that 60 seconds? No, you knew the order of it. See, there's an order in God's Word. There's an order to everything He's asked us to do. He says forgive, but He doesn't put an and, a but, or an or on it, right? He says to have patience, to wait on Him. There's no if, and, or but, or or on that either. So if we want to get the results, if we want to get what, you know, James 3 promises about applying God's wisdom to our life, what does that mean? It means we have to make the choice, the daily choice, the moment-by-moment -moment choice that when life comes at us, when that situation arises, family member, work, text, email, choice, whatever it is, we have to make the decision, do we flee? Do we do like Jonah? Do we flee from what God wants us to do? Or do we obey? Do we serve the flesh or do we choose to serve God? It's really simple. For a number of years in my own life, I complicated my relationship with God. It's like, oh, it's all this. It's got to be all this. You got to do all this. You got to say all this. You got to, well, what you got to do is just get your heart right with God, get into His Word, develop your prayer life, develop your relationship with Him. And as you start to develop your knowledge of God's Word and then make the choice to apply it, it is a truly amazing the control you get and the things that God can do in your life when you start doing things His way. So I want to wrap up with this question. Well, one last thing real quick. Um, they're going to pass out some cards. I did a conference the other day, so this is a little bit about inviting me to speak. Uh, but would you take this and just pray uh, that the Lord uh, would continue to use um, the Handling Life ministry? We reach about 3 million people a month on social media. We get about uh, 8,000 or so podcast downloads, about 150,000 uh, views. And I get messages every day from all over the U.S., actually all over the world, of people who are like, hey, I'm a Christian, I love the Lord, but I have found myself in something that I don't know how to get out of. I don't know who to talk to. And if you're in that situation, if you're going through something in your life, find somebody. 
Find somebody that you can sit down and say, hey, brother or hey, sister, I'm struggling with this. Can you help me through this? Because the question here is, what would happen in your life if you stopped fleeing God and started doing things God's way? Can you imagine what would happen? And I'm sitting here not as you going, oh, I've got all this figured out because I still have my struggles. I still have my challenges. I still have things that I struggle with every day. This is more a challenge to me and everybody here. Can you imagine what God could do with Kerwin Baptist Church if we all started not only saying we were Christians but acting like Christians? If we started really applying God's word to our life? So I appreciate you all letting me share with you, and I hope you all have a very Merry Christmas.